our brains literally sit in a fishbowl, right? We call our skull and it's floating around this fluid we call cerebrospinal fluid. My point is you don't even need a physical blow to your head to sustain a concussion. Number one, you don't need to see stars or you don't need to lose consciousness either. Right. I've had people again, if this, you know, the trauma is strong enough, even a body blow, right? That force could then go up through their body, through their spine, into their skull, shake their fishbowl, and then their brain sloshes around in the skull, right? So again, you don't need to have a physical trauma to your head to sustain a concussion. It could be a strong enough fall on your wrist or your shoulder. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below. It's a little red button, you punch that, and it's gonna notify you every time we put out a new episode that can help you improve your bone health. And then also, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for the free seven-day osteoporosis kickstart. That's gonna walk you through everything you need to be doing right now to get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. After you do those two things, go ahead and press play on this episode, and I'll see you inside. Welcome, welcome to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. Joining us today to explore a leaky brain and bone health and how they are connected is Dr. Titus Chu. Dr. Titus Chu is a two-time number one best-selling author, award-winning international speaker, and holistic brain expert that specializes in healing concussions naturally. Dr. Chu helps wellness-seeking concussion survivors find the missing pieces to their health puzzle so they can fix what's wrong and finally get back to feeling normal again. Using advanced brain testing, state-of-the-art treatment technologies, and his clinically proven concussion recovery programs. Dr. Chu is the author of Brain Save and Leaky Brain Fix. He works with patients and private clients from all over the world, both online and in person at his holistic brain centers in California. You can learn more about Dr. Chu's innovative root cause approach to concussion care at brainsave.com. Dr. Titus Chu, welcome to the show. It is great to be here. Good to see you, Kevin. Well, good to have you here. And your work is fascinating. It really is. And and helping people uh, improve when they've got a concussion. But I want to understand how you even got into this field in the first place. So uh, why did you become a functional neurologist? Yeah, so it happened over 21 years ago now. Wow. I was actually on my way to work and, on a scooter and I got hit by a car and I flew off the sco scooter, ended up breaking my ri three ribs, dislocating my shoulder. And I didn't know it at the, the time, but I actually suffered a concussion. Uh, thank God I was wearing a helmet because if I wasn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. So, you know, I tried everything I could at that time. I had this, you know, I survived, but I ended up with this chronic neck and shoulder pain that I just couldn't shake. And everything I tried, didn't work. I tried everything within the conventional medical system and nothing cut it. So I decided to go outside the box and I went back to school. I got a postdoc in clinical neurology. I got a master's in nutrition. I studied, even went so far out of the box, I studied chiropractic, acupuncture, energy medicine, functional medicine, anything that I could get my hands on to figure out what was going on with this chronic pain I was having. And I'm so glad that I did because along the way, I began to experiment with a lot of the things that I learned in school and reading books and attending workshops. And after years of this chronic neck and shoulder pain, it disappeared, began to magically disappear. And what was really fascinating on top of that, some health issues that I had even prior to that car accident, like I used to get sick all the time, you know, Kevin, I just, I thought that I just had a weak immune system. Even that I, I noticed, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm not getting sick as much. And I used to get, you know, really uh, tired and, you know, especially after eating, I get tired and just crash. And those things started to improve as well. My energy, my skin even improved. Like I used to get these random hives that just kind of pop out out of nowhere. And I thought that I just had sensitive skin, right? And all the topical creams never cut it. But after I experimented with all these things that I learned, not only did my chronic body symptoms like the shoulder and neck pain go away, but a lot of these other things that I've always struggled with my entire life. 
And so that's why I became a specialist because I experienced, you know, through my own journey, the healing power of the body when you give it what it needs and you get rid of what it doesn't. That's beautiful. Yeah. And it's, that's so important. It's a, such an important part of any healing journey too. And when we're talking about brain health, so you created these, uh, you said they're, they're clinics out in California. Is that right? Where you're yeah, so I see patients. People? Exactly. Yeah. So I p see patients both virtually and also in uh, my clinics. I have a clinic that I see patients in Northern California, as well as Southern California, not too far from where you were just at, where we we're talking about in San Diego. Um, I have a place in Orange County that I see patients as well. So yeah, but a lot of the stuff that I do, is pretty cool. You know, there's advanced treatments that we can do to jumpstart the brain health, you know, jumpstart a person's nervous system, right? Through technologies and in-person treatments. But I found again, through my own journey, through this whole process, a lot of these things that really can help jumpstart a person's brain health are simple things that they can do at home. And we can talk about that in a little bit. But that was the interesting thing, you know, it's like, as I was going through this journey, right? You know, everything that I described to you, I changed my diet, I start, you know, exercising more and practicing stress management. Like a lot of those body symptoms, they started to melt away. And I'm like, wow, this stuff works, right? But what was really interesting was, I would say probably like three, four, maybe five years after that car accident, I started to develop brain symptoms. And I found myself on this up and down roller coaster, even though my body felt stronger, you know, I had more energy, um, I didn't get sick as much, that neck and shoulder pain got better. I found myself having these brain symptoms like, remember one day I was at a, a taco restaurant at a taco bar, right? Eating tacos, sitting on a stool, just minding my own business, enjoying this delicious taco. When all of a sudden the whole room felt like it moved like that. I literally felt like the room had like someone had taken the building and shook it side to side. And I almost fell off my stool. I'm like, what was that? And so I started developing these strange neurological symptoms. Now I know, you know, fast forwards, that's what we call oscillopsia. It's a fancy term for when your eyes are no longer stable and then they move involuntarily, giving the illusion that the room is moving. So that's actually what happened to me. Number one, I started developing that. And then I start developing vertigo where I have these sensations where I'm moving and the room spinning, right? In addition to that, I started to develop more like stress issues where it was really hard for me. I was found my resilience, right? And my bandwidth to tolerate stress was starting to go south. And I felt myself just getting really triggered easily and really irritable. Right. Even to the point where I started developing more psychological symptoms or, you know, I never had anxiety before, but I just start finding myself like perseverating and worrying about things like and not being able to let things go. And it was really it was kind of scary because all these things I'm describing, these brain symptoms like the vertigo, the oscillopsia and even the psychological symptoms. I never had those, right? And like, especially the mental emotional stuff, I I grew up in a really, you know, loving, supportive family. I never had issues like that. And I found myself just really struggling. And it was, it's kind of scary because I didn't know why, right? And then I realized, I'm like, wait a second, all this stuff began, right? About five, six years prior after that car accident. So I actually had suffered this concussion. Like I said before, I didn't know it at the time. And that's the thing with concussions, the reason why they're so insidious is because they they might the symptoms might not show up for like several months. And in my situation, years, I'm, there were early warnings, right, and early clues, but I just didn't pay attention to that, right? But then like when these things started to really surface up, it was like, I remember, you know, I get, it got to the point where I would like, my energy started to crash again, where... I would be, you know, seeing patients in my clinic and then I'd have lunch and I'd literally just like my brain would shut down and I have to take a nap and then I had to set my alarm so I wouldn't be late to see patients, right? So it's like all these symptoms, even though my body symptoms got better from all these things that I learned in school and, you know, changing my diet, 
I began to develop these brain symptoms. And then from there, I knew it was from that original trauma. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I want to take one more minute to talk about if you are somebody who was newly diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis, and you're at a point where you're stressed, you're worried, you're overwhelmed, you have no idea where to start or how to get started getting confident in your plan. I want to tell you about the Stronger Bone Solution Program. Over 5,000 people have come through this Stronger Bone Solution Program, and it walks you through the exact process you need to fill in the missing pieces, uncover critical things in your plan that you may not be aware of, and help you make modifications, adjustments, and tweaks to get you to the place where you're building stronger bones. I want you to get confident in your plan so that you can focus on living life and enjoying the life that you deserve with the people you love most. So if that's where you wanna be, head over to bonecoach.com forward slash apply and apply for our Stronger Bone Solution program right now. I'm Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I want to see you inside this program. I want to help you get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. Hope to see you inside very soon. Let's get back to the episode. What are, what are the early warning signs and clues that you've had that concussion? Like, how does one know that they've had a concussion? What does that what does that event look like? You said a car accident for you, but I'm imagining that it. You know, we hear about it with people who play sports all the time. It's the football player that rams the helmet together, but sometimes it's like our audience is primarily women, 50 to 70 plus. They're not out on the football field flashing helmets. Um, maybe they're in a car accident. What else could could lead to this? Yeah, exactly. And a lot of my you'd be surprised because a lot of my patients aren't athletes. I, I have worked with some of the top athletes in the world, like Olympians and whatnot. But the majority of the people that I work with, my patients and clients, yeah, they're women. They're professional women who are really health conscious and they are doing everything right. They're eating healthy. They're taking supplements, kind of like what I was doing at the time. But then they might be, yeah, be in a have a car accident, right? Or even I've had people fall off a bicycle, not even hit their head. They fall off their bike. Maybe they're mountain biking or they're on a bicycle. They fall and they land on their either on their wrist or shoulder, and then they develop the concussion because that's the thing, Kevin. Most people, including a lot of doctors, unfortunately, think you need to even have a physical trauma to your head, like a head injury, to sustain a concussion. You don't, because if you think about it, your brain, and I, I uh, removed my brain for this episode, so for those of you who are just listening, I just pulled out my model brain, right? And so our brains literally sit in a fishbowl, right, we call our skull. And it's floating around this fluid we call cerebral spinal fluid. My point is, you don't even need a physical blow to your head to sustain a concussion, number one. You don't need to see stars or you don't need to lose consciousness either, right? I've had people, again, if this the, you know, the trauma is strong enough, even a body blow, right, that force could then go up through their body, through their spine, into their skull, shake their fishbowl, and then their brain sloshes around in the skull, right? So again, you don't need to have a physical trauma to your head to sustain a concussion. It could be a strong enough fall on your wrist or your shoulder, right? Number one. Number two, a lot of people think that you need to lose consciousness to have a concussion. That's not the case. For me, like I got winded, like after like I got thrown off my motorbike, like I couldn't catch my breath. And that was actually, that was a very terrifying moment because I thought I had punctured a lung or something. I had never had literally the wind knocked out of me and that's what happened, but I didn't lose consciousness, right? So that's the this tricky thing is car accidents, even whiplash, even if you don't hit your head, right? Even I've had patients who've been on like a roller coaster, and their body was shaken enough. They didn't hit their head on anything, but that was enough to trigger a physical trauma to the brain. So, so that's the key is like, you know, looking back, you know, in some ways, again, my, my sense is that there probably were early warning signs that I had a concussion, but I was so focused on fixing this chronic neck and shoulder pain, right? It was ruining my life. I couldn't do the things that I loved. I wasn't be able to be as active. And so I was so fixated on getting that better that I missed these early warning signs again. like, And that's the thing, again, for people you know, who have been in car accidents, 
right? And have had even just physical trauma, if it's strong enough, you know, the thing to watch out for is you might not develop concussion symptoms months or even sometimes in my situation, years after that injury. And and could it be, I mean, what are what are these other early warnings? You mentioned early warnings. So what what are those things specifically? Is it like this event happens and then somebody has issues with short-term memory or somebody starts to have issues where maybe they're vomiting or, uh, you know, what are some of the other early warning signs that maybe longer-term issues are on the way? Sure. So again, I look at it for me, I was pretty lucky because I didn't have any of that. I didn't have vomiting. I didn't have dizziness after that car accident. It was this pain. But yeah, some of the most common symptoms I see my patients have after, if they develop symptoms right away, could be nausea. It could be dizziness. A lot of times they just feel really tired and fatigued. They're just like, whoa, I just really need to sleep. And that's actually, believe it or not, the brain's own wisdom telling the body, hey, you need to rest because there's inflammation, right? So it could be just feeling really fatigued. It could be um, light or sound sensitivity. It can be headaches. It could be neck pain. Like those are the most common kind of early symptoms of that you might have a concussion, right? Um, again, dizziness, vertigo, where you feel like it's you know, the room spinning. If that's the case, that's an acute concussion, then you definitely want to get checked out. But that's the thing. What I've learned, 85% people who actually have a concussion, within a few weeks, they recover. But 15% don't. And they struggle with these symptoms months or even years after that original trauma. It's what we call post-concussion syndrome, where they're having brain symptoms well after the actual original injury. And that was the case for me. Again, it wasn't until at least the bigger warning signs that something was going on. It didn't happen till several years out, right? You know, that being that being said, there are other factors at play that we can talk about in a bit. You know, my sense is that I had what's known as leaky brain and it wasn't fully recovered. And that's what I see a lot of the time. My patients, they might have had a concussion and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I've had, you know, they get on, I get on a call with them and they're like, yeah, I actually had, this is my fifth concussion. You know, and the previous four, literally within a few days, I just get back to, you know, being active again, get back to get work or whatever I need to do to be fine, quote unquote, fine. Right. But it wasn't until this last one and it wasn't even that strong. Right. I was in a little minor fender bender or I fell off my bicycle and all of a sudden, like things went south. I see that time and time again, because the dangerous thing about concussions is they build up over time. Right. When you have one, majority of people don't get the proper care. They're able to function, maybe not at the same level that they were before, right? Just a little bit, but it's manageable. So they don't even think about it. And these things continue if they have another trauma, even if it's minor, they that inflammation starts to, you know, get higher and higher. Then even a small little, you know, incident can then lead to these big symptoms. And that, that was actually was the case for me. It wasn't just that car accident I was in 21 years ago. I actually had several other minor physical traumas. And then, but they were, you know, I didn't really address them. Even me being this brain expert, I wasn't addressing them until I hit rock bottom and everything fell apart, right? Where I could barely get out of bed to make it to see my patients, where I was having these just almost not, like panic attacks and worry and all these other neurological symptoms. Then when that happened, it's like something's going on and I need to do something about it. You mentioned leaky brain. What What is leaky brain? Let's talk about that. Yeah. So leaky brain, right? Going back to my brain model here. So we have our brains, right? It's the most precious organ that we have, right? Like, and they're the most amazing organ, I think, as well. Like, in between our two ears, right, there are more brain cells than there are stars in the galaxy, right? And our brains allow us to feel, they allow us to think, they allow us to have dreams, right? To be able to focus on our health and our loved ones. That's the power of our brains when it's working, right? But when it's not, 
things can go south really quickly. And we can experience things like brain fog. We can experience things like brain fatigue, anxiety, depression, on and on. And so because our brains are so precious and also sensitive, we have protective measures. We have obviously our skull, and that protects our brain as much as possible from external forces. But on top of that, we have what's known as the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier helps protect our brain from internal forces. So what I mean by that, as we sit here right now, as I'm talking to you, Kevin, and as people are listening to this or watching this, all through our blood vessels, we actually have toxins floating through our blood vessels, right? I mean, research has shown that the average American has tons of different toxins floating in their blood, their bloodstream, even like toddlers and children, right? We unfortunately live in a toxic world. Point being, right now as we speak, we have toxins flowing through our blood. We have inflammatory compounds called cytokines. We have all kinds of things floating in that thankfully are protected from entering our nervous system, right? And the way that our nervous system is protected by these things is what we call the blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier, it's like a barrier. It's like a wall that protects your brain from internal forces. So things like bacteria, in addition to toxins, things like viruses and other pathogens. So even like uh, molecules from your own immune system, any of these things, if they were to gain entry into our brain and nervous system, all heck can break loose, causing massive, massive inflammation and leading to things like brain fog, brain fatigue. Um, a lot of patients I work with who have uh, long COVID is because they have brain inflammation that's just off the charts. And a lot of patients who start to develop early memory issues, like for being forgetful, or you know, they're really worried about developing Alzheimer's or dementia, because even though they're younger, maybe in their 50s or 60s, they're starting to see some of these early symptoms. Again, a lot of that is because of inflammation. And that's actually the, the through line, the connection between bone health and brain health, right? In fact, the research shows there's a article in the scientific journal Neurology that was released earlier this year, March of 2023, that people who have low bone density may have up to 42% increased risk of developing dementia compared to people who have higher bone density, right? And people, you know, a lot of times when I tell my patients, it's like, well, I don't, what's the connection? Again, that through line is, you know, Kevin, being the bone coach, is inflammation. When you have inflammation, that's one of the biggest things that could not only damage your bones, but on top of that could damage your brain and nervous system. So one of the things that protects our brain from these inflammatory damaging compounds and chemicals is that blood-brain barrier. Now, the thing is though, this blood-brain barrier, it sounds really like strong and robust, right? But that's the thing, it's not. It's so fragile. It's literally made up of a single cell layer of what we call endothelial cells. So you can imagine this blood-brain barrier surrounds your blood vessels that provide nutrition to your brain, right? So it allows things that should come into your nervous system like glucose and oxygen and other nutrients. It allows things that should come in to come in. And then, like I said earlier, this blood-brain barrier, this single cell layer also prevents things from getting in that shouldn't get in. Toxins, pathogens, bacteria, viruses, so on and so forth. But like I said, it is so very thin and so very fragile, right? And so one of the most common causes of, you can actually have a breach of the, your this blood-brain barrier. So it's imagine it's kind of like your brain is the hottest nightclub in town. Right. And obviously, if you have the hottest nightclub in town, you're not going to let any old riffraff into your club. Right. You're going to have a bouncer, a security guard and system. So the people who have tickets, they can enter your club and the people that don't, they're not allowed in. So that's what the blood brain barrier does. But with trauma, and this is what happened to me again, in retrospect, when I look back 21 years ago, and research shows, scientific research shows that with physical trauma, that blood-brain barrier, this single cell layer of this wall can actually have micro tears 
And when that happens, guess what? Those riffraff from the street that don't have tickets to the hottest nightclub in town, they can actually enter your nervous system and cause massive chaos throughout. And that that's the thing. It becomes this vicious cycle because trauma is one cause of what we call leaky brain, where we have a breach of this blood brain barrier trauma like I did, like I had over 21 years ago. But guess what? Body inflammation as well can also cause leaky brain. Right. So research shows that these there's these compounds we call cytokines. They are chemical messengers of your immune system. They cause inflammation. And at too high levels, they can cause damage to your tissues, including your bone, bone, right? As well, your bone cells, as well as your brain cells. And so inflammation itself can also damage your blood brain barrier. So what ends up happening, and again, when I look back in retrospect and what I see time and time again that happened to me, but also to many of the patients who developed these post-concussion symptoms months or years after that original injury, they developed a leaky brain and it began to heal, but not fully. And so what ended up happening, these things that normally shouldn't enter their hot nightclub, right? They get in, trigger an alarm. And then the soldiers come in to like get rid of the riffraff, but at the same time, they not only cause damage to the nervous system itself, but it also continues to degrade and erode that blood brain barrier. So more and more things to get in that shouldn't, causing more inflammation and then further damaging that blood brain barrier, creating what we call leaky brain. And that's the thing, right? As you know, Kevin, the alarm system, the soldiers of our immune system, like the cells that protect our body and our brain, they're not just stationed in one area, right? Like if if there's enough of an alarm, you're going to have the SWAT team come in, you're going to have the Marines and all those guys come in to take care of the riffraff. But unfortunately, the bigger the damage and inflammation, the more stronger the inflammatory response leading to collateral damage. And it can start spilling out not only out of your nightclub and into the streets, but it can go to different neighborhoods. So I've seen time and time again, trauma from like a concussion causing leaky brain, causing further damage within the nervous system. And if that wasn't handled, then those chemicals can actually trigger inflammation in the gut, could trigger inflammation in the bones, so on and so on forth. So it becomes this vicious vicious cycle. So how does somebody know if they have a leaky brain? So some of the most common clues, you know, that's a great question. Number one, brain fog, right? So having brain fog, because when the brain is inflamed, the remember I was talking about all those, you know, billions of neurons we have, normally there's a like efficient communication between them, right? But when your brain becomes inflamed, that communication becomes muscled. Right. And then it becomes slowed way down. And so people can experience things like brain fog or slight memory issues. Like they walk into a room and they're like, why did I walk in here? Or they're looking for their car keys or their glasses. And they're like, where are my glasses? Right. And they're literally on their head. So these little memory slips, a very common clue that you might have leaky brain in addition to brain fog and these memory slips are what we call brain fatigue where if you're like really using your cognitive capacity, you're like listening to a podcast or you're watching, you know, uh, like the news or you're reading something that takes a lot of mental energy, starting to fatigue, not the body, right? That's different. That's a different type of fatigue, but what we call neuro fatigue or brain fatigue. In addition to that, other clues that you might have leaky brain anxiety, right? So even mood disorders, depression, right? There's a thing we call sickness behavior syndrome, where when people have inflammation, they actually end up developing different behaviors where they're just like, they don't want to get out of bed. They feel unmotivated. What I described to you, you know, a few minutes ago, that's, that was me because at the time I didn't know it, but I had brain inflammation and leaky brain, right? So those are some clues. In addition, the research shows that you know people who have chronic migraines or headaches or chronic pain that can also be a clue and a very common clue one of the most common things when a patient or client talks to me and they say this i'm like okay 
I'm pretty sure you have leaky brain, is when they might feel good one day, right? They're clear, they're, you know, either their mood feels good, they feel happy and relaxed, or mentally they feel really clear and really on point, right? You've had those days, we have had those days, right? And then like something happens then they don't even know why sometimes, maybe they didn't get a good night's rest or they had a little bit of stress and then boom, they're like, oh my goodness, my brain literally shuts down. I have brain fog, I'm upset, I'm triggered, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, whatever it is. It's like this up and down roller coaster where they feel good one day and then other days they feel terrible and they have no idea why. And that's one of the biggest clues that a person has a leaky brain. And any um, any uh, any lab tests too, like anything that we can specifically look at. I know from an inflammation perspective, there are probably tests we can look at too, but anything specifically for the brain from a lab test perspective? Yeah, great question. And that's the thing, right? With the advent of new technologies, there are actually ways for measuring leaky brain. And some of them are super like expensive, like high tech, more based on research ways of measuring it. So even things like different types of imaging, like MRI, there's different ways of checking for leaky brain, but those are pretty expensive, right? And there's more invasive ways like lumbar puncture, where you can actually measure inflammatory chemicals. Remember I talked about that fluid that your, your brain floats around in, in the fishbowl. That's what we call cerebral spinal fluid. And there's ways that we can measure what's happening there and check for those inflammatory compounds, right? And, you know, give us a clue that there's a good brain. But those things are invasive. They're very expensive. And a lot of them are for, still for research purposes. Whereas in my practice, I found that there's a simple blood test that you can do, right? Even in at-home blood tests, there's actually technologies now where I have patients and clients from all over the world where we can ship them the simple at-home blood test. They can measure to check to see their risk for leaky brain, right? So it's pretty amazing how far the technology has gone. I remember actually, um, this is probably about four years ago, I was hanging out in uh, San Francisco and I was at the Whole Foods there. And there's this really interesting guy, this Asian guy with kind of, he looked like an Albert, uh, Asian Albert Einstein, right? <laughs> he had this long flowing white hair, really interesting guy. And just happened to sit next to him at the, the food bar and I'm eating my food and we just strike up a conversation. He's like, oh, what do you do? I'm like, oh yeah, I specialize in brain health and concussion. And he's like, oh, interesting. You know, I'm actually in the biotech world and I do a lot of research. I'm like, oh, cool. It's like, what do you research? And he's like, oh, I actually research what's known as the blood brain barrier and leaky brain. I'm like, get out of here. So I'm like, he's like, yeah, you know about it? I'm like, yeah, totally. Like S100B, is that what you guys measure for this? And he looks at me like I was like, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, like jumped out of like a, a, a gift box or something. He's like surprised. Like, how do you know about S100B? That's one of the proteins that you can actually measure for leaky brain. And I'm just like, yeah, this is my specialty. This is what I do. Right. So it's pretty cool. We had a really cool conversation, but my point is it's so like now that was about four or five years ago. Now the technologies there were literally a simple at home blood test can measure your risk for leaky brain. And the great news is even if you do have a leaky brain, like I said before, the body has a wisdom. Many times, just like a, a other tissues, just like bone tissue, you know, just like body tissue and muscle tissue, brain tissue can also heal, including the blood-brain barrier, right? And many times I find it heals on its own. But if a person already has inflammation, right? And what's a clue of inflammation, body inflammation? You have issues with your bone, right? Weak bones. If somebody has clues of inflammation or joint pain right in their body there's a high likelihood that that in those inflammatory chemicals can also damage the blood brain barrier as well and so the good news is though right if you identify you have leaky brain and then you identify what other factors are causing it because like i said before kevin trauma is a very documented scientific reason why people can develop leaky brain but guess what did you know that mental emotional stress can also trigger leaky brain? Like a mental emotional trigger causes the release of cortisol, 
which also has been shown like high levels of cortisol, as you know, can also lead to things like weak bones, but high levels of cortisol can also damage the blood brain barrier. There's research shows that leaky brain can be triggered by mental emotional stress. In addition to that, leaky brain could be triggered by toxins. So a lot of the things that cause weak bones can also damage the blood brain barrier and lead to brain inflammation and brain symptoms as well. So for those of you who are on this call and are, you know, working on strengthening your bro- your bones, don't forget about your brain because again, 42% people who have low bone density have an increased risk for developing dementia, but the great news is, as you know, Kevin, dementia doesn't happen overnight. Meaning it usually starts about 20 to 30 years before people even start developing symptoms, right? And so a lot of times when I tell my patients that they're like, they get a little scared. They're like, oh, really? But I see it as a massive opportunity for turning the course of your ship. If you have a family history of Alzheimer's or dementia, begin turning that massive ship now, right? 20 to 30 years before you end up facing that fate, right? And so that's a great thing. If For those of you on the call who obviously are interested in supporting your bone health, don't forget about your brain, your most precious and sacred organ, because there's so many things you can do to help improve your brain health. And one of the most important things I've seen is fixing leaky brain. It's interesting, as you were talking about some of the contributors to leaky brain, the trauma, the toxins, the stress, more people are probably familiar with leaky gut until you've just discussed leaky brain. But a lot of those things are contributors also to leaky gut, which is really interesting. Um, yeah, no, actually, and I'm glad you brought that up because what's really just, I'm going to nerd out with you a little bit here, yeah, right? Please. Remember we talked about that single cell layer that makes up that blood brain barrier, that the, the, you know, the fence that protects the hottest nightclub in town, those cells and the way that they're stuck together, right? So imagine it's kind of like you have these panels of these fences, right? And then in order to maintain a strong fence, you need strong glue and you need strong nails. Those are what we call tight junctions. Well, guess where else those tight junctions are found? Just like you said, you know this, Kevin, and I'm sure many of your audience, those tight junctions are also found in the gut barrier. So my point is this. Leaky gut can actually cause leaky brain and leaky brain can also cause leaky gut. Because if you have damage to your barrier, regardless if it's the gut barrier or the blood brain barrier, like we talked about, your immune system can launch an inflammatory response attacking those tight junctions, not only damaging your gut, but again, like I said, those the those chemicals can also flow through your blood vessels getting to your blood fit brain barrier and vice versa and so time and time again i see this vicious cycle where someone either has leaky brain and then that also causes leaky gut and then that causes further leaky brain or vice versa someone who has leaky gut then actually triggering leaky brain and then becoming this vicious cycle so the point is though regardless if it's one or the other if you, typically what happens is you develop both, so both need to be fixed, especially if you're having symptoms of both leaky gut and leaky brain. And how do you fix a leaky brain? Let's go. Let's go there. How do you fix the? Yeah, leaky brain? exactly. Let's not just. Uh, it's not all doom and gloom, right, Kevin? As you know, the body and the brain have a wisdom, and there's things that we can do and be intentional about. So. There's a lot of different things that we can do to help support healing a leaky brain. But in my practice, three of the most powerful things are number one, SPMs. Number two, exercise. And finally, number three, diet. So the first thing when I say SPMs, SPM stands for Specialized Pro-Resolving Mediators. So they're a special compound that your body can actually produce from things that we call omega-3 fatty acids. So a lot of people I'm sure on this call listening to this have heard of the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids to help decrease inflammation, to support heart health, bone health, as well as brain health, right? Well, the interesting thing is those omega-3 fatty acids, when we talk about the brain, when you eat, like say you eat some fish, like 
you know, wild caught salmon or something, or you take like a fish oil capsule, your body digests that, absorbs it. And then part of that, those fatty acids actually get embedded into your brain cells. Remember we talked about communication, right, between our brain cells, which really determines brain function. One of the main ways that we have optimal brain communication is through these things by way of the omega-3 fatty acids, right? And so it's kind of like these telephone wires, right? So would you want to have like an old school kind of telephone wire setup, or do you want to have like the fiber optic, right, internet connection? So when you have, when you eat things like fish or algae, for those of you who are, you know, vegans, those omega-3 fatty acids actually get embedded into your brain cells, allowing for better communication. The problem is though, if you are stressed, if you have exposure to toxins, which I said the majority of us do, if you have inflammation in your body or brain, what ends up happening, your body in its wisdom will take those omega-3 fatty acids that are in your fiber optic, right, your wires, it will remove them because those omega-3 fatty acids could then be used to put out the fire of inflammation. That's great because that helps promote healing. But guess what? At the expense of brain communication. Again, that communication starts to get muffled and then your brain no longer works. So that's why I find that people who have brain inflammation or leaky brain, these SPMs, those are actually the compounds that your body produces from those omega-3 fatty acids. So meaning if you have inflammation or you're stressed or you're experiencing brain fog or memory slips, rather than just taking, you know, getting your omega-3 fatty acids from fish or other sources, when you supplement with SPMs, research shows that is a very, very powerful natural anti-inflammatory, right? It's helped with people with chronic headaches and migraines, helps with people with chronic pain. And in my experience, it really helps put out the fire of brain inflammation. So that's the first thing I recommend is specialized pro-resolving mediators. And so the second thing, like I said before, is exercise. Research shows, again, exercise, as you know, Kevin, being the bone coach, so very important. Right, not only for strong bones, right? That piezoelectric effect that you get, which triggers growth of bone cells. But in addition to that, exercise has been shown to help increase what we call BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is miracle grow for your brain. When we talk about, you know, I I love the brain because it's really all about potential, right? The better our brains function, the more we can step into our potential. But one of the ways that we can step into our potential is through this miracle we call neuroplasticity. Just like muscles and even bone cells can get stronger, so can your brain through this process called neuroplasticity. My point is, so it's kind of like strengthening the connections between your brain cells. One of the most powerful ways of doing that is through this compound called BDNF, miracle Grow for your brain. And so exercise not only increases BDNF and strengthens and protects your brain from, you know, disease and trauma, but on top of that, it increases circulation throughout, right? And so one of the most important nutrients for your brain is oxygen. So that's the second thing. So not only does exercise help with brain function, protecting your brain, as well as strengthening your bones, it also has been shown to help strengthen and heal a leaky brain. And finally, number three, third thing is diet, right? Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. If you're finding it helpful, please leave a positive rating and review. Hit that like button, subscribe to the podcast or the channel. That lets us help more people and reach and serve more people. And it also lets us know that this is helpful to you on your journey to better health and stronger bones. And then also, right down in the show notes, you can actually find a link to my free bone healthy recipes guide. That's going to give you access to some amazing and delicious recipes to support your journey to stronger bones. And then also we have a link to my free stronger bones masterclass in the show notes too. And that 
is the three-step process that has helped people in over 1,500 cities around the world get confident in their plan for Stronger Bones. Over 110,000 people have, have taken part in this and it's been really, really helpful for them and I want you to have free access to it too. So add your name and email right down there in the show notes, get access to that free Stronger Bones Masterclass and let's get you confident in your Stronger Bones plan today. And so one of the most common causes, like I said, outside of trauma for leaky brain is inflammation. And one of the most powerful things that we have control over to put the fire out of inflammation is the food that we put in our mouths, right? And so there's certain foods that have been shown to help be beneficial for brain health and to damage brain health. So beneficial foods, again, are healthy fats. So things like medium chain triglycerides found in things like coconut oil, MCT oil, Avocados are a great source of what we call monounsaturated fats, very good for the brain, olive oil. And when when you know taking choosing olive oil, be sure to get the extra virgin organic stuff, right? Because then you get all those really delicious dark polyphenols, which are natural compounds that can also put out the flames of inflammation. So yeah, so healthy fats, one of the best things for your brain. And we already talked about the omega-3 fatty acids. But there are certain foods that are very damaging, and I'm sure you know, and right, many of your audience, but some of the biggest ones that also damage the brain and nervous system, as well as the bones and body, are things like gluten, right? And number one, and dairy. So gluten, as you know, found in many different grains, so things like pasta, cupcakes, right, all the delicious foods, unfortunately, those can also not only trigger inflammation in the body, impact your bones, weaken your bones, but also damage your brain and nervous system and trigger leaky brain as well. So yeah, there you have it. Three things you can do to fix leaky brain. Number one, you know, definitely omega-3 fatty acids. But if you want to go with the pro tip, the specialized pro resolving mediators, number two, exercise, right? Simple exercise, even just walking, right? 30 minutes a day has been shown to decrease your risk for dementia and Alzheimer's. And find number three, making sure that you eat right for your brain type, avoiding foods that create inflammation and choosing foods that are healing. And I love what you just did there. You told us, then you walked through all the steps, then you told us again. Was that a brain reinforcement tip there? That's how we do. <laughs> That's, That's how, how we, we do. do. Yeah. Well, Dr. Titus Chu, I appreciate everything you've shared. This was a fantastic episode. Really enjoyed this. I'm sure our audience learned a lot as well. Uh, and I know you have over on your site, you have a leaky brain quiz. Can we talk about that for a minute? And then let's talk about where people can find you. So talk about what the leaky brain quiz is and then where people can find you. Yeah. So great question. So I talked about earlier, like there are advanced tests, like super expensive tests all the way to these lower investment at home test kits to check for leaky brain. But whenever I start working with my patients and clients, like for those of you on this call who can relate to any of the symptoms, the brain symptoms I mentioned, like brain fog or that up and down roller coaster, or you're relatively healthy to begin with, but you have a family history of Alzheimer's or dementia, and you want to do whatever you can to prevent that fate, then go to leakybrainquiz.com. And it's a simple quiz that I developed after years of working with patients and healing my own brain, right, to quickly ascertain your risk for leaky brain. So leakybrainquiz.com, it's a simple quiz that you can fill out. And then once you fill it out, we will send you your risk, whether it's high, medium, low for leaky brain and start giving you some information uh, to help further empower you in taking back control of not only your bone health, but also your brain health. Wonderful, Dr. Shu. And then anywhere else you want to, anywhere else you want to, where can they find you at? Social media channels, anything like that? Yeah, I'm also on Instagram as well as Facebook and YouTube. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Titus, thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge and expertise with us. For everybody listening, you can find all the resources, show notes, everything mentioned here today over at bonecoach.com. I'll link to those resources down in the show notes and we'll see you in the next episode. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Hope you found that episode helpful and that you enjoyed it. Just one last reminder, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for your free seven-day osteoporosis kickstart. It's gonna tell you everything you need to do to start getting on the path to improvement. Hope you found this helpful. I'm your Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I'll see you soon.